On almost every Think Like a Leader video, I open up a text, exegete that text, and apply it to leadership, specifically spiritual leadership, pastors, missionaries, campus missionaries, all types of spiritual leaders. Today will be different than that. Um, not only will I not open up a text and exegete it, I want to talk about scripture, but not one text. Well, I guess I could say my text is all of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, every part of that that deals with the life of David. But I'll just give an explanation and fly over of that. Uh, another thing that'll be different about this, think like leaders, I'm going to talk about politics. And no matter where you are in the world, you either have just had an election or you have an election coming up sooner than later. And so there is a need at some point to talk about how we as spiritual leaders, as pastors, as missionaries, as campus missionaries, as, as every type of spiritual leader there might be, how do we engage in the political process and how do we lead our people in that way. Now there's several guiding principles as we look at scripture and again we're going to look today at David's life but sort of a narrative of his whole life and particularly three instances when people spoke into his life. We think of David as yeah, he was a king, he was a national leader, he was a government leader, he was the political leader and People at the highest levels of leadership rarely have people who will be honest with them and speak truth in their lives in terms of wanting to actually help them. Uh, there are a lot of public uh, criticisms, and sometimes that is truthful, sometimes it is not, uh, but they're used to that. But to have someone who, with a good motive and a caring, loving, uh, pastoral attitude who approaches government leaders, political leaders is very rare. I'm thinking about this because I'm, I'm shooting this from the Philippines and in a couple of days we'll have uh, almost a hundred Every Nation leaders from around the world and our three cohorts of students at Every Nation Seminary and I'll uh, be busy with that but also with the Victory Church 40 year anniversary. So there's a lot of things going on but as a part of that I was invited to a meeting by our Victory Bishops Council. It is a gathering of about 40 church members who are elected officials. Uh, they've run for office, they've been elected. Some of them, it is their first foray into politics. Others have been elected to various positions and they've been reelected and they're veterans at this. And they're all ages. They're uh, people my age and older and there are people um, the age of my children, of my sons and even younger than those. But what they have in common is they're all members of our church and they're all uh, elected officials at, from the highest levels of government to the local, uh, the most local um, elected positions. And so I've been thinking about this. How do we engage? So I get I have the privilege of talking to those elected officials uh, this week, but I've been thinking about that as pastors. How do we engage? Uh, because I, I hope that every leader in the every nation world, no matter what nation you're in, you'll have an opportunity to, uh, to mentor, to pastor, to disciple, to engage with the gospel people who are elected officials at every level. And so I want to give you a few principles of that, okay? And so as, as I talk with pastors here in the Philippines who are involved in this process, there are a couple of principles that we build by. Number one, our advice. <clears throat> when we're giving advice to elected officials, it's always spiritual, never political. The advice we give is not political advice. It's spiritual advice. And, and it's important to note that when you are pastoring or discipling or being a spiritual mentor, a spiritual advisor to an elected official, then you are there as a spiritual leader, not as a political pundit. And, and here's the warning that I give to people in these positions as a spiritual leader is that I'm going to advise you what's best for your soul, what's best for your witness. And sometimes what's best for your soul and sometimes what's best for your witness in a, in a watching world is disastrous for your political career. But I'm committed to the health and growth of every elected official's spiritual life, even if it destroys their political career. And as pastors, that's our role. We are spiritual leaders, we're not political advisors. Secondly, the relationship we have with political leaders, with elected officials or appointed officials, it's pastoral, not transactional. And what I mean by that, a pastor, the, the, the biblical idea of pastor is also the word shepherd in the New Testament. And a shepherd will leave the 99 and go after the most vulnerable one. A shepherd would lay down his life for his sheep. A shepherd sacrifices for the sheep. A, a shepherd serves the sheep. And our role with church members, 
uh, whether they're business people or educators or artists or politicians. Our job is the same as a shepherd, as a pastor. It's to serve and care for their souls. And so our relationship is pastoral, meaning we serve and sacrifice expecting nothing in return. It's not transactional. I'll do this for you if you do this for me. And politicians and elected officials are used to negotiations. They're used to everyone wants something for them. Everything is a trade-off. And I plead with pastors and spiritual leaders, and I warn pastors and spiritual leaders, don't get involved in that. Uh, either serve with nothing expected or disattach. But I wanna be able to look at government officials and clearly in the eye and say, I'm serving as a pastor, as a discipler, as a spiritual mentor. You owe me nothing. I don't want anything from you. I don't want money, I don't want influence, I don't want contacts, I don't want selfies. I expect nothing. I'm here to serve you, not to leverage a relationship so that I can get more likes or follows or whatever else goes on on social media platforms. We're not here to leverage anything. We're here to serve as unto the Lord like we do anyone else in our congregation. So what are the foundational principles here? It's our advice is spiritual, not political. Uh, our relationship is pastoral. It's not transactional. And finally, our goal, our goal with mentoring and discipling and pastoring elected officials, political, political leaders. And, I, and I'm about to borrow a phrase from Pastor Chris Zahner. Chris. Thank you. This helped me. Um, I'm Chris's preaching coach at Every Nation Seminary, and we were talking about a sermon of his recently, fantastic sermon. Wow. I told him I was going to use this, so Chris, here it goes. I'm going to use the words of Pastor Chris Zahner. Our role with government officials is to call them up, not to call them out. To call them up, not call them out. And calling people out is popular in our culture. What that means is to embarrass publicly, to humiliate publicly, to confront in public or really on social media often, and eventually to cancel them. That's sort of the end game there. Uh, but we're the opposite of that as pastors. We're not calling people out. We're calling them up to a higher moral standard, up to a higher ethical standard, up to a higher walk with God above the fray and walking in a different plane with different accountability to the Lord, not just to the voters. And so our role as pastors, when any member of our church is messing up is to call them up to a higher walk with God, not to call them out. As I meet with these elected, these Filipino elected officials who are really serving their nation and serving their constituents and serving the Lord, um, I'll also have in that meeting that I'm about to uh, be involved in, the pastors of each congregation who are the pastors of these elected officials. And they're doing a great job of calling those leaders up and there are private conversations that happen quite often in terms of spiritual advice, but not political, in terms of pastoral input, not transactional, and in terms of this whole idea of calling up, which is done in private, not calling out in public. And every one of those pastors who will be in the meeting I'm referring to have been publicly chastised for not publicly rebuking certain government officials. And I know there's a validity to that at some point, and I'll get to it in a moment in David's life, but um, if you look at the prophetic models um, of Nathan, and so let's take Jeremiah or Elijah. Jeremiah and Elijah were very public in their rebuke of the kings, and very public in their, uh, in their calling out in some ways, whereas Nathan uh, the prophet with David was very private. And they're both valid in some instances, but I think for the most part, pastors' roles and pastors' job and pastors are uh, to enter into a private world where there's pastoral ministry going on, um, not to make a big fanfare out of that. But if you feel called, some of you may have a little more of an Elijah or a little more of a Jeremiah uh, sense on your life. That, I'm not saying that's bad. Uh, I'm talking about how I've operated really as a foreigner and in the Philippines, um, it's been private and most of our pastors go about it that way and I think they do a wonderful job. Now, let me give you the biblical, biblical narrative to this. Um, these principles of pastoring and discipling and working with people and 
who are elected officials. Think about the life of David. Uh, he had his ups and downs like every leader. There are no perfect leaders. Uh, there are leaders who mess up and do great and mess up again and do great and all different levels of messing up. Sometimes it's just a wisdom issue or a not understanding what they're getting into. Or sometimes it's a very much a sinful issue like some of these in David's case. But there are three times he had people speak into his life and that's a rare uh, gift that top leaders have for someone who will speak the truth who really care about them. And David had it three times. In 2 Samuel 12, Nathan approaches David. It's in private. He tells a little parable and he, and he says, hey, uh, David, Nathan's a prophet. And he says, David, there was this shepherd with a whole bunch of sheep and there's this other guy that only had one and he took the one. And David got so angry and, and um, starts declaring judgment on this guy. And of course, Nathan looks at David in private and says, you're the one, that's you, that's what you did. You took Bathsheba from her husband had him killed. And so the sin of David, his, his moral failure, his ethical failure was confronted by the prophet. And, and that's a pastoral role. That's what he did. Then in 2 Samuel 19, we find Joab. Joab wasn't a prophet. Joab was like the uh, head of the military. He was a soldier. He was a general. He, uh, he was a violent man protecting uh, his nation and his king against all types of enemies. And, and, and we see he goes to, in chapter 19, he goes to David and rebukes David. Nathan rebuked David, but it was about moral and ethical issues. It had nothing to do with David being king. It had nothing to do with that. It had to do with his own moral walk before God and how he had violated that. Whether he had been a shepherd or a businessman or a musician or the king, it didn't matter. That was the pastor's job there. But now what Joab does is different. Uh, as the head of the military, he goes to his king and, and says, if you don't change the way you're leading. This is a political confrontation and a political and a military issue. David was messing up. The way he was coddling Absalom, who was in the midst of a rebellion and a coup, and David is not dealing with it as a wise leader. And Joab says, David, you're going to lose the army. You're going to lose the military. These people have sacrificed and served for you and served you, and they're willing to do anything for you, and you're treating them like they're nothing. And so David listened, and he shifted gears because Joab boldly spoke political correction. And then you have Gad. In the last chapter of 2 Samuel, verse, uh, chapter 24, we have the story of David demonstrating a lack of trust and faith in God. And we also have him demonstrating really a level of arrogance and pride and really even narcissism uh, that was grievous. And so the prophet Gad goes to David and brings a rebuke and a judgment from God. And of course, the, the whole book ends with that. You, you know the story. So here, here's the summary of this, of the narrative of David. Um, Nathan, the prophet, rebukes David for moral and ethical violations. Gad, the prophet of God, rebukes, corrects David for some character issues that caused him to make bad decisions as a political leader. But neither one of those were political in their very nature. They had to do with David as a leader. And that is the role of a pastor. What we will not do as pastors is do what Joab did and step in. And Joab had every right to do what he did, but he wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a spiritual leader. He was a military leader. And he spoke to the king and, and made some political adjustments. Our job as spiritual leaders is to be the Nathans and the Gads in the lives of elected officials to call them up privately to a higher moral standard, to call them up to a higher ethical standard, to call them up to higher character standards into a place of humility rather than arrogance. Nathan and Gad did that. Let's stay away from trying to be a Joab and trying to influence politically, but let's fulfill our roles boldly without apology in the areas of prophetic and pastoral input as spiritual leaders.